And here we are at chapter 3, verse 5 of the book of Esther, getting back into our lovely Father's word. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. Notes. Well, apparently Mordecai's disrespect had not been observed by Haman until the king's servants called his attention to it. And I say disrespect with a touch of irony because that's really not what it was. Verse 6, And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had not showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. Notes. In other words, he didn't reveal... He, it, it, had, it hadn't been showed to them that they were Jews, okay? Well, in the mind of this evil man, Mordecai, as a Jew, had insulted him, and the Jews, and that meant that all Jews would actually have to pay the penalty. How stupid does that really actually sound? Uh, one guy makes a tiny mistake, and everyone has to pay this horrible price. Now... A very, very wicked man. Verse 7. In the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is, the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month, from month to month to the twelfth month, that is, the month Adar. Notes. Uh, this verse does not mean that twelve months were employed in seeking by means of the lot a... Uh, propitious day uh, for the slaughter of the Jews. It meant that the astrologers sought for a favorable day month by month, and at least, uh, well, at last they chose the 13th day of the 12th month as promising success. Uh, we'll find that in verse 13. Okay, Verse 8, And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. And their laws are different from all our people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. Notes. Oh, he's just lying out his teeth. Oh, the basic thrust of all of this is just simply not true. Oh, there might be an occasional royal edict which a Jew could not obey... But that was very, very rare. Anyways, as long as it didn't hurt the kingdom, the Persians allowed all the conquered nations to retain their own laws and their own usages and what not. Anyways, verse 9. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those who have the charge of the business to bring in, into the king's treasuries. Notes. In other words, he's going to have them give them money to pay the expenses uh, for those who would carry out these terrible crimes. Verse 10. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Haman, or, uh, here we go with one of those names. Uh, they gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamidatha the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. Notes. Uh, this was a type of royal seal and gave Haman liberty to do almost anything he desired. Okay, It's like he, uh, the king is saying that he has royal approval for this man to go do whatever he wants to. Very, very dangerous to give someone that kind of authority. Verse 11. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. Notes. Concerning the silver, whatever wealth the Jews had after they were slaughtered, Haman could take that for himself. Oh, I bet this evil man was uh, watering at the mouth right there. Also, you can do whatever you like with these people, in effect, the Jews. Oh, so he's just loaded up with all the horrible things that he can do to get his evil plots to going the way that he wants them to. It's not going to work out quite that way. Verse 12. Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every providence, or province, I should say, 
and to the rulers of every people of every province according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language and the name of king Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring notes <clears throat> now all of the edicts were written in the king's name even when a subject had been allowed to issue them well of course we're talking about Haman verse 13 and the letters were sent by messengers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Note, now, this parallels a lot of the things that we saw in World War II. The commands were very explicit. Every single one was to be killed. As stated, this was a satanic plan to destroy the possibility of the Messiah being born into the world, who would actually come through the Jewish people, and more specifically, the tribe of Judah. You can find that in Genesis 49, verse 10. One attempt right after another, we had angelic influxes coming in, uh, perverting the seed line, one right after another. We've had more than one attempt to destroy Jewish people, and it's all in an attempt to basically make God into a liar and make it impossible for uh, Christ to actually be born through a perfect, unperverted seed line. Well, it just kind of makes sense that if you, you can't have a Jesus without Jewish people, okay? It's all just a attempt to make God into a liar, but... John the Baptist had something to say about that to those Pharisees in the book of Matthew. He said that out of these very stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. So, it's really not an obstacle, but it's definitely, it's definitely a satanic attempt, even though it would fail miserably. Verse 14. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto the people that they should be ready against the day notes. And that day was the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which was their march. Verse 15 The messengers went out being hastened by the king's commandment and the decree was given to Shushan the palace. And the king and Haman sat down to drink but the city Shushan was perplexed. Notes Now these two, having assigned an entire nation to destruction, they proceed to enjoy themselves at a banquet of wine. Now the city of Susa, being perplexed, had to do with the widespread feeling among many other nationalities that the president now being set was a very, very dangerous one. They couldn't see the justice of this, not at all, and they were really kind of confused by it. Why in the world would the king just send his people to be destroyed? Well, he had been tricked by Haman. And as well, almost every time in the Bible that we see alcoholic beverages being used, it is always, as here, in a negative sense. They're getting drunk. They're acting stupid. Anyways, chapter 4. When Mordecai perceived that all of this was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. Notes. Now... This is strange to us, but it wasn't really all that uncommon for these particular people to uh, throw uh, sackcloth over their bodies. It was a sign of grief, and it, to an extent it continues to today. Verse 2, And came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. Notes. Now, sackcloth is very, very unattractive and very, very dirty, and it was also common for the Jewish people and some some groups of Arabs to actually throw dirt up into the air and let it fall down on them as a sign of their distress, and due to the manner of this, he was not allowed to pass through the gate into the palace, okay? A very, very dirty thing to do, but that was the custom. Verse 3, And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came. There was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Notes. 
and who in the world could blame them? They're being basically sentenced to death for absolutely no reason, unprovoked, uh, no reason at all for any of this, but the king has been deceived. Keep that in mind. He's been lied to by, uh, by Haman right there, saying that the Jews are dangerous people. Why, they'll just, they'll just crawl right out of the ground and just bite you when you're not looking, huh? Oh, what sad nonsense. Verse 4. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her about Mordecai. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. <clears throat> Notes. Now Esther, in the seclusion of Harem, knew nothing of what the king and Haman had destined to carry forth. So as stated, she didn't know the reason for Mordecai's great grief. Verse 6. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all the happenings unto him, and of the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave him a copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she could that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. Notes. Esther's marriage took place in the seventh year of the reign of Ahasuerus. You can find that in chapter 2, verse 16. And this murderous decree was issued five years later, almost, well, about five years later. You can find that in chapter 3, verse 7. Okay. Verse 9, And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again Esther spoke unto Hatak and gave, his comma and, and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come into the king, into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, uh, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in under the, king's, uh, the king these thirty days. Notes. Well, this is a little bit of a strange custom. She did not realize that these past thirty days had been spent by Haman in persuading to kill all the kings and Jews. Or, I mean, not all kings, but... Um, by the king, he was trying to persuade the king to kill all the Jews. Boy, what a stumble there. Verse 12. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with yourself that you shall escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if you altogether hold your peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether you are come to this kingdom for such a time as this. Notes. Well, he's saying basically, due to the fact that you aren't Jewish, Mordecai says, you're probably going to die as well. But Mordecai is confident that God will not allow the destruction of his people for reasons that should be plainly obvious. But even though the Lord will spare the nation some way, Still, many Jews will die, and you and I will definitely be among them if you don't act, is what Mordecai is saying. And to be sure, this is exactly why the Lord had raised up Esther to this particular position. The Lord knows these things, past, present, and future, and therefore he functions accordingly. And as much as he is also almighty, he can basically do whatever he likes without violating the free moral agency of anyone. We'll pick up and... Chapter 4, verse 15. Thank you, and God bless.